Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. On Sunday night, President Hugo Chavez of Venezuela was re-elected. Now joining us from New York City to talk about his views on the election is Gregory Wilpert. He's a sociologist who between the years 2000 and 2008 lived in Venezuela, where he taught at the Central University of Venezuela, and he also founded VenezuelaAnalysis.com. In 2007, he published the book, Changing Venezuela by Taking Power, the History and Policies of the Chavez Government. He moved back to the U.S. in 2008 when his wife was named Consul General of Venezuela in New York. And since returning to the U.S., he's been adjunct professor of political science at Brooklyn College. Thanks very much for joining us, Greg. Hi, thanks for inviting me. So uh, the polls had been showing Chavez ahead, and the polls more or less turned out to be correct. And he's now elected for a new term, a six-year term, I believe. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about what the challenges facing Hugo Chavez are. Uh, what do you think are the main things he needs to accomplish over this next period? And, and uh, to some extent, why hasn't he already accomplished some of these things? I think one of the main things that Chavez has to accomplish is to um, gain the trust of the uh, youth. Um, I'm not saying that he necessarily lost uh, most of the youth. However, since he's been in office for 14 years, uh, he, there's a significant uh, proportion of the population, about 30 percent of the population, that uh, basically grew up under his government and uh, who have become frustrated with various problems and don't have the reference point that uh, Chavez always talks about, which is the pre-Chavez era. And so these problems are problems such as crime and corruption and inefficiency in the public administration. That's some of the main problems and issues that the youth um, <clears throat> have serious problems with, and um, and they need to figure out they they want that addressed, obviously, in a way that uh, that uh, that gives them a brighter future, really, and uh, for whom this uh, comparison to the past just doesn't doesn't have much impact. Right, and, and some of those youth were, were in the opposition. I mean, uh, you, you see a lot of young people in these op opposition protests. There were a fair number of university students that that were in the opposition. I, I know a lot of them come from the sort of more elite classes, but. Not all. I mean, in the sense that some of them are the kids of, of professional families and, and working families in Caracas, too. Uh, you know, Caracas is fairly divided. But when, when, when uh, Chavez went to Cuba for his medical treatment, one of, the, one of the times he came back, he did a kind of a self-criticism where he said that some of his rhetoric against the opposition and against some of the middle class opposition, you know, he'd call them squalitos and things like this, he said that it was probably a mistake. He, he shouldn't have labeled everyone under the same category. Uh, has he changed that language and has he changed, do you think there's evidence he's changing his approach to those other sections of the population? Well, he goes back and forth on that. Um, sometimes when he gets very frustrated with the opposition and uh, becomes very strident, he, he falls back into this old language of, of insulting, basically, and of uh, disqualifying the opposition. And then afterwards, he apologizes and, and tries to end for a while, uh, manages to tone down his, uh, his uh, verbal rhetoric against uh, the opposition. And that's, of course, also something that turns off many voters, I think. And Chavez knows this, which is why he uh, tries to um, back, you know, step on that and, and improve it. And <clears throat> the thing is that uh, the, uh, the people who, uh, this youth that we're talking about, who grew up under the Chavez government, they actually, many of them benefited uh, tremendously and uh, were given social mobility through Chavez's policies. However, as they rise, so to speak, in the you know, and as, as Venezuela uh, becomes a less in, unequal country, um, their their aspirations change and their willingness to identify with Chavez and with his uh, rhetoric of rich versus poor um, doesn't um, doesn't have as much of an impact on this on this rising uh, youth really that that um, that was enabled. Thanks to Chavez's um, mostly educational policies and other social policies. Now we should put all this into context. I, I, we're kind of assuming everyone else has fo already followed the results of the election, but Chavez won this election by ten points, and there was a massive turnout in, in the in the celebrations and in the pro-Chavez rallies of young people. So you know clearly there's a, a he has a big support amongst youth. But you're talking about who's in that 45% that voted the other way, or, or young people who may not even be old enough to vote yet. 
but you know, who have, real, you know, have questions about why the pace of progress has not been more swift. Yes. I mean, one of the things that I always find interesting when you look at polls that divide um, the voting preferences according to uh, both age and according to social class, you see that Chavez has overwhelming support in the poorest sectors of the, of the population, which make up about half of the population, uh, which is kind of, they're usually referred to as the classes E and D, which are the poorest. But it, where he has one of the weakest supports, of, obviously, as you go up, it, um, it weakens. But uh, the middle class section, it uh, really drops off quite dramatically. That as soon as you know, people become slightly well, better off, uh, their support for Chavez drops. Well, just, just for the sake, let's define what you mean by middle class. Because the United States, they use middle class as a way to say working class. But for some reason, they don't want to use the word working class. When you're saying middle class, what are you talking about? Well, basically, I'm talking about people who live, uh, you know, something like a t double what Venezuela's uh, poverty level would be, which is still quite poor, because the poverty level is set very low. Um, I mean, it's people who might still live in the barrios, but have slightly bigger, uh, better incomes, who are, um, you know, they might, you could call them working class, perhaps, but, um, but they, you know, they have uh, studied a little bit at, um, you know, a technical school or something like that, and, um, and yeah, I don't know. It's it's very difficult to describe, really. But but there are people that have a have a job that have a you know re, in the Venezuelan context relatively decent pay. We're not talking about you know well higher paid professionals, and we're not talking about the poor. We're talking about you know what right. working class people with working class jobs that pay okay. Exactly. Right, and you're saying there his support falls off, but one would think he should have support there. Exactly, and, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very common phenomenon that this uh, this group of people that belong to that class aspire to something better and uh, are much more willing to adopt the viewpoints and and worldview of um, the class that, so to speak, just above them, and uh, and therefore their rejection of Chavez is even stronger because they want to uh, they you know come from that poor background and and basically want to leave it and and therefore uh, reject everything that. Uh, is associated with that background, and, and Chavez belongs to that. Well, if, if Chavez wants this 21st century socialism to last beyond him, and this is assuming that his health stays good and he fulfills his whole six-year term, but he, in, one, one assumes he's hoping this is something that sets a course for Venezuela for decades, not just for another six years, he needs that youth, and he needs that working class youth, and he needs to address some of these problems that have been lingering for what many people think too long. And I guess starting with crime is one of the most important. People are afraid simply to go out at night and even to some extent in the day. And, and we've talked about this before in previous interviews, but what are some of the recent things he's been doing to try to solve this, and, and what is the, the direction these policies are going in? Well, it's uh, it's a policy that was started a couple of years ago already, um, but which is of course still very late in the in, in the Chavez's presidency. Um, but a couple of years ago, they started implementing a new national police force to replace the municipal police forces. And the reasoning is pretty clear. I mean, the, the municipal police forces were completely and hopelessly corrupt, and the local mayors had no way of combating them or replacing them or improving them. And so the national government really had to step in there. And um, now there's a transition phase, and they're being uh, instituted or being introduced in the municipalities uh, very gradually, uh, bit by bit, and the, this transition process from the municipal to the national police is extremely slow, and it's going to take several more years, actually, for it to be fully implemented. And in the meantime, you also have various transition problems where, uh, where there's more uncertainty be precisely because of the transition, although once they're in place, actually crime has dropped in those municipalities quite dramatically. I mean, well, crime is still pretty high, but by 20% more or less on average, which is a pretty significant uh, bit, but a, a lot more remains to be done in that area. Right. Now, I, I've, when, when I was in Venezuela, I heard some people suggest to me that one of the reasons crime isn't more cracked down on is that a lot of it's being organized out of the barrios, the, the poor areas, and this is also the base of Chavez electoral support, and there's some reluctance to go after some of the, some of the kind of more organized crime there. Uh, because it may affect the outcome of elections. Do you think there's anything to that? Uh, I'm 
No, I'm not sure because the problem is, of course, obviously the high crime rate is affecting Chavez just as much, or probably a lot more, I think. Than, uh, and uh, especially since, you know, the, even though he might count on the support from some of the people who are connected to crime, I really think that's uh, exaggerated and not, it's not that uh, significant. Now, certainly the people that suffer most from the crime are actually people in the barrios. Yeah, and they're much more. The people who suffer from crime, the number of victims basically are far more larger than the people who perpetrate it. Right. So, so, I mean, people do ask this question then. There's been enough money, there's been enough resources. Why does it take so long to, 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 to face up to this or deal with it? Well, like I said, it's a very difficult problem which takes a long time to just deal with in general. Any country in the world would take a long time. The big problem really was that Chavez recognized the problem very late. Uh, that is, you know, not until almost 10 years into his presidency. And uh, the reason for that is simply because uh, there was an assumption that once you lower the crime, once you uh, decrease inequality, crime will resolve by itself. And that just didn't happen. And so it was a massive miscalculation, I think, on the part of the government. Right, that if you deal with the social conditions, you don't need to deal with the policing in the same way. So, what, what, so after crime, what are the, in terms of this youth, uh, this working class urban youth that are div quite divided about Chavez, uh, what, what else does he have to do to kind of win them over or solve some, what's the next problem they want solved? Well, I think it's also the quality of the education. I mean, they, one of the people are very grateful, I think, that uh, and many new uh, educational programs have introduced and given tremendous amounts of opportunity to them. But they've been introduced very quickly and uh, with relatively little funding, although I mean, obviously, a lot of money has been spent on it, but professors and teachers still don't get paid very much in Venezuela. And so the quality of the education is actually, uh, it's increasingly recognized that that is an issue. And I think that's an issue for this, this segment of the population. And the, the, the other issue I heard when I was there is that there, there, there was a lot of support in the barrios for some of the uh, on-site uh, Cuban, often Cuban doctors that were doing like what GPs do. But there's a lot of critique about the hospitals themselves, that once you get past that kind of GP level care that was created in these new medical centers, that the hospitals didn't live up to what pe people's expectations were. Yeah, that was, uh, I think, a major issue actually a couple of years ago. In the meantime, uh, many, almost all of the hospitals actually have been thoroughly renovated. I mean, there's still places that uh, that haven't been dealt with that still need to be fixed up. But I think a lot of investment has been made in that in that area, so that's not such a big issue anymore. So, uh, who else is in that 45 percent that voted against Chavez? And we know the more the really rich and elite sections on the whole. Uh, were anti-Chavez, but that the, the, they don't make up the rest of that 45 percent that voted against him. No, I think there's also a segment of, of the people living in Barrios who, who aren't uh, young and who who've, uh, who used to be Chavez supporters. As a matter of fact, there was a series of articles that I think dealt with the uh, the problem uh, very badly that is in the New York Times and in the Los Angeles Times, but but uh, it is an issue in the sense that uh, there are people who used to support Chavez who who aren't young but um, live in the barrios, and basically they've become disenchanted for a variety of reasons. And I think one of the main reasons is to see the persistence of uh, corruption and clientelism in many of the social programs that that do exist, and and the inefficiencies. Uh, for example, Venezuela has constantly struggled with a housing problem and and building. Public public housing, but oftentimes that gets all uh, mired in, in uh, local corruption and so on. And so, so that's some, one of the things that also has turned some people off. I mean, that's really his big challenge, isn't it? To, to find a way to govern more effectively. The people, I mean, much of the opposition, people that actually vote against him, really do support much, many of the objectives of, of, of the, his, his administration. They're fed up with the ineffectiveness of some of the execution. Well, exactly. That's one of the reasons why Capriles, the opposition candidate, was running practically on the same platform as Chavez. He was promising to continue almost all of Chavez's policies. I mean, many people didn't buy that argument that that was what he was really going to do, but he had to do that because he realized, I mean, he was he's smart and he realized that that was a major reason for Chavez's popularity. Okay, well, in the coming weeks and months, we're going to follow some of these big issues like, like crime, like education and such, and, and, and see how this next term unfolds. And we're going to make Venezuela kind of a, a regular go-to story, and we'll be going back to Gregory, and we're also going to have some people go, go again to Venezuela, as we have in the recent last few weeks. Uh, so, and if you want to see more Venezuela stories, uh, you know, there's a donate button over here because it's expensive to send people to Venezuela. Uh, Greg, thanks very much for joining us. 
Thanks again. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.